As we continue our lesson, as we uh, started on last Wednesday, as we're dealing with healing, one of the characters that we looked at as Joseph. And so what I want to talk about um, in our continuation from our Wednesday night Bible class is I want to talk about trauma. It's one of the things that we don't talk enough about in the Lord's church is trauma and actually what is trauma. Sometimes you can have individuals that walk through the door and you think that they're okay. You think that everything is well. And then what you, what you, don't, what you don't realize is people have gone through some traumatic events and some, and some traumatic things. And, and the way that I behave may be a result of unresolved issues. I did, a, uh, I did a lesson, I think, on this last Friday night uh, in talking about the results uh, and talking about the, uh, my volume, please, uh, talking about the results on uh, last Sunday. Many of you are familiar uh, with last Sunday. Um, unless you were not on earth, uh, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't know what I'm talking about. But if you was on earth, uh, then you know what happened uh, last Saturday. And even though everybody was talking about the event, if you realize something's wrong, you can look at a human being and say something's, you're not, something's not right with you. Have you ever seen somebody go off and even though they're going off and they shouldn't be saying the things that they're saying, but in your mind you're like, I think they need some help. Right? I, 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 I remember seeing uh, there was a lady in, the, in a, a parking lot and she was just screaming and yelling at the, per the clerk and she just went into the parking lot and she was just going back and forth and doing all those types of things. Uh, but, but what somebody really needed to do was to lay hand and say, I think something's wrong. What, what's going on? Sometimes you can be on the verge of a nervous breakdown and it just looked like you having an attitude, but, but you really wanted to scream and says, I, I'm losing it. Have you, ever, have you ever been losing it, but you couldn't really sit, tell people that you were losing it? And then people keep coming at you and people keep sending text messages and people keep coming in your face. And you're saying, hey, listen, I think everybody need to get away from me because I'm, I'm losing it and I'm about to snap. And have you ever got to a certain point where you, be, you said to yourself, you know what? I'm willing to lose all my relationships right now because I can't take another comment. And you'll end up blowing up on somebody who actually really love you. But what they did not detect is that you're on the verge of losing your mind. Because most of us, we don't have one problem. Many of us, we have multiple problems because you're dealing with your bills and you're dealing with health and you're dealing with your relationships. Are you dealing with your loneliness? And then you're dealing with car issues. And why them lights in the dashboard keep lighting up? And what is that? What is the cold? I don't know. And, and you say, Lord, I just trying to get from A to B. I'm trying to get back home. And what is going on with it? And all of a sudden, some things, and then and it'll be little things that just stop working and just, and you just feel like the devil. And, and it ain't the devil. Sometimes it's just life, but you're taking in water. Say, so Brother Williams, I'm here this morning, but I'm sinking. I cried on Thursday. Brother Williams, I cried on Friday. I cried on Saturday night. I just got up and put some makeup on and just walked up in here. I'm talking to the sisters only. But I'm, uh, <laughs> you know, we pray for that, you know. And, and, you know, I'm just coming in. I'm just now getting it together. And I'm going to sit in here for this hour or so, and I'm going to act like I got it all together. But I, I know that the moment I walk out this building, it's waiting for me back in the car. And it's heavy. And so here we are in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 37, just in recap, Joseph, Joseph brothers sold him. You may have had a, la a bad week last week, but at least your brothers and siblings didn't sell you into slavery. It's a good point. <laughs> you know, like, uh, it's a good point. Yeah, I, I had a rough week, but it wasn't like that, you know. <laughs> and, the, and the Bible says, and the Bible says he, he's one of the youngest of his, his siblings, and he goes to see his brother. And the Bible says when they see him, in, in Genesis chapter 37, when they see him afar off, they say, 
Let's sell them. Somebody even suggested, no, 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 let's kill them. Now, if that ain't traumatic, have you ever had some family members say something to you that you only expected your enemies to say to you? Have you, ever, have you ever felt that if you wondered if something really bad happened to you, would your family even check on you? Would they even care? Have you ever thought about what people would say at your funeral and who actually would show up? Who, who actually would really miss you? You'd be surprised at how many Christians walk around and say, I don't know if I'm really loved. No, I know like when you see me, like, hey, it's good to see you. But I'm wondering like, who really is going to miss me? Are y'all just going to, y'all just going to eat some chicken and go back to work? Like what is, like what's the schedule that's going to be? Like w will there even be a pause? Will, will anybody even be shocked? And he's going to go see his brothers. He's 17 years old and his older brother said, let's kill him. One of the oldest brothers, he said, hey, listen, he felt kind of bad about this. I don't really think we do. Hey, let's just, let's just throw him in a pit. So the Bible says the pit had no water in it. They grabbed him and they threw him in the pit. And then the Bible says, after they threw him in the pit, you, you, you want to know what they did? You, you want to know what they did? I know you because you're excited this morning because I'm excited because I'm, <laughs> I'm excited to tell you. Uh, I, I'm, I'm excited to tell you. Uh, and, and the Bible says uh, in verse 23, um, and it came to pass when Joseph was coming to his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him, and they took him and they cast him in a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. They sat down to eat bread. Hey, listen, like after you throw me in the pit, like don't sit here, don't sit here and have a Lunchable. <laughs> they just opened up a Lunchable and they just start eating bread and some cheese and just like, the conversation was about killing me. You changed your mind, and now you just threw me in a pit. And while I'm sitting in a pit, you just going to have lunch? Man, there's some things that some people can do to you. It'll break your heart. Especially when you thought you were, man, well, one of the most difficult things is when you think you're important in somebody's eyes, and you're not. <laughs> you're like, you're like, yeah, no, you're not. You're not. You're not that. You, you ever had your, bu your bubble popped? Have you ever came around the corner and you overheard people talking about you? And you, you, get to, you get to a certain point where you read something that somebody wrote about you. And you thought, I thought I was. I, you know what? It's my fault. I thought that I was, that I weighed more with you. So I didn't know you were so quick to just throw me to the side. I don't know what he's thinking in the pit. I don't know what he's thinking in the pit, but I can imagine if, if I was in the pit, you know what I would be thinking? When I get out of this pit, <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, like it's going down. Like when I get out, I'm looking for a rock or a stone or something that I can be able to take. Cause when, and, and I may not even know how to fight, but if they get, I'm, I'm, I'm scratching, I'm trying to stab, I'm trying to do everything that I possibly can do. The Bible says while he's in the pit, there's no sound. Have you ever known? While he's in the pit, there's no sound. He's just in the pit. They're eating. Then they change their mind. They, they, see, they see some travelers and they say, you know what? Let's make some money off of them. This is Judah. J J Judah spoke up. The tribe of Judah, the lion of Judah. Judas, Judah spoke up and said, let's, let's sell them so we can get some change. I don't, I don't know where they're going to spend the money in biblical times. Like, where you, like where you go party in biblical times for some change, you know? He said, but then we can go get some change, you know? Go buy some sandals or something. Uh, and so they sell them. And the Bible says that when they sell them, uh, Reuben comes back because Reuben wasn't there. Reuben comes back and his idea was, I'm going to take my brother 
And I, we just, you know, I let them be punished for a little, for a little while. And then, you know, when nobody's looking, I'll rescue him and then just take him back home. You know what's also traumatic? Is that people who were supposed to have your, your back in public, they care about more about what other people think than standing up with you. As Christians, you gotta learn to embrace trouble. And the reason why you need to embrace trouble is because trouble reveals who really supports you. Sometimes you can be mad that God set fire to it. Sometimes you can be mad that the devil got in and all this trouble happening and, and you mad because you got in fin financial strength. Sometimes it's good to financially struggle so that you can step back and take a look around to see, okay, who are my real people? When it, when it look like you finna fail, and it looked like it's been over. And sometimes what God will do, sometimes God will announce your trouble. Some people go through trouble and it's private, right? Nobody knows that you're going through what you're going through in your home and in your life or in your relationship. So you can kind of keep it private. That means where every time you walk outside of the house, you can keep your face and you can act like everything. But sometimes every now and then, God will take your trouble and he'll roll it down the street. And now everybody knows what you're going through. Now you got to learn how to lift your head up. But, but, but the reason why you need to lift your head up while you're going through trouble and everybody knows your situation, uh, the reason why you need to lift your head up so that you can see who steers away from you. See all, of, see all of the people who see you coming and then they go the other way. And then you know what you need to do? You need to take note of it. Got it. Okay. Hey, and, 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 and they, they act like they don't see you. Duly noted. <laughs> Got it. When I get back on my feet, don't text me. <laughs> when, I get, when, I get back on my, when I get back on my feet, don't pop up and say, hey, what's going on? No, 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 no. Because I saw you. I, I saw you when you was down. I'm going to still respect you. I'm going to still honor you. I, I, I won't call you out your name. I, I won't put you down. But at least I know where to... Much of our pain comes from us putting the, the wrong people in good places. And, and, and as you mature, you'll grow up and you realize, you know what? I got to stop putting people in places that I want them to be and put them in places that they're showing me who they are. Because it hurts when you put the wrong place, a person in the wrong place. And you can't blame them because it was your fault. You put them in that place in your heart. It's not, the, it's not their fault. So sometimes you want to be angry because you'll be like, why did they do that? But you know what? They were always like that. And they never said they were for me. I said that I was for them. I said that I would have their back. I said that I would go to 10 for them. I realized they never, you know, one thing you need to be real notice, uh, that you need to notice in, in your spirit and, and in your speech. Uh, I'm, sometimes children grow up and children will say, that's my best friend. And then the best friend would say, <laughs> have, you ever walked in, have you ever walked into an event or a room and somebody introduced you and then say, ah, oh, listen, this is one of my best friends. And they pointed at you and you were looking around because you thought somebody was behind. <laughs> <laughs> and you, did, you didn't realize that they saw you that way. That can happen even in family. That you was like, this is my family. But somebody, everybody doesn't look at family the same way that you look at family. You can grow up in the same house, eat the same food, do all, have the same parents, and they treat you differently because envy, jealousy, whatever the case may be, they just are in a different space. Have the same thing in the church. We're all supposed to, we use the word family. It's supposed to be a church family. But even with church family, you still have to look because they cut you. <laughs> church family will cut you. <laughs> You'll be, you'll be out here praying, uh, going back to your car limping because they took a foot. <laughs> Church family can be ruthless because everybody doesn't have the same understanding. 
Oh, how traumatic it must have been that he's sitting in his pit while his brothers are up, uh, 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 up on top and they're eating, discussing his destination. So you know what they do? They, they sell him. They sell him into slavery. He goes into slavery and now he's a slave in another man's house. And the Bible says he starts working, he starts working. And, and the Bible says everything that he puts his hand to, God blesses it. Even though he was mistreated, everything he puts his hand to, God blesses it. Matter of fact, he does so well that Mr. Potiphar comes to him and says, hey man, I wanna give you a promotion. I'm not setting you free. <laughs> if you go back and read the text, I'm not setting you free, but what I'm gonna do is I'm going to promote you to be the second in command to my estate. Now you got to understand, most of us, we live in an uh, apartment or a house. We don't know what an estate is. Uh, a state has maidens and, and butlers and people who work the field. This, this man was very important in Egypt. He, hold, he held position and he had an estate where he had employees and people who ran his estate. And, and Joseph worked so well that he promoted Joseph to be second in command. Now, now notice this. You're doing much better now. And if anybody was to be able to see Joseph, Joseph was 17 years old when he was sold. He was the youngest in his family and, and he was loved by his father, but he held no power. He held no power while he was at home. Fast forward to the next chapter and now he's second in command over this general's house and now he's running employee. He's now the supervisor and he's running this estate. And I know what you're thinking. You're looking at him saying, oh, didn't he overcome? Last time I saw him, he was in the pit. And when he was in the pit, we thought it was over. But look at him now. As I look at him now, he's on his feet. He's second in command. He's, he's running the place. The Bible says that Potiphar gave him all power to his estate. The only thing that Potiphar knew was what was for dinner. He gave all the power to Joseph. And the Bible says that Joseph looked good. Some of you have that curse. Jo Joseph, Joseph looked good. And so... Um, and, and when, you, when you look good, you attract certain things, all right? One amen, thank you. Anybody? No, nobody else with the gift? <laughs> no, nobody else with the gift. And so you, you attract certain things. And so Sister Potiphar, uh, <laughs> Sister Potiphar, she, was, she would look at Joseph. She would look at Joseph. And she didn't, she didn't, say, any, she didn't, she didn't say anything at, at first. Uh, if, you, if you go and read the text, the Bible says, after a while. It wasn't immediate, because some people, you know, some people haven't, they haven't seen your full aura, but after a while, they start to, <laughs> they start to get stuck. You understand, you understand. <laughs> so, and so the Bible says after a while, she became attracted to him. And so what she said was, um, hey, listen, you know, uh, appreciate all the work that you're doing on the estate. And so, <laughs> um, one of the things, one of the things that uh, I want to be able to show my appreciation uh, for some of you know, some of you VBS graduates know this. <laughs> you know the story. Uh, <laughs> she said, "I want to show my appreciation to you." So uh, I don't, I don't know what your week is, what your week is looking like. Uh, if Monday is free. Uh, I don't know if your your Wednesday uh, evenings are free. What your evenings are, if morning is better for you, I don't know what's going on, but I want to be able to show my appreciation. So, you know, my room is right around down the hall, and whenever you're ready, I'll be able to congratulate you on a job well done. And so, because there's children, because there's children in the room. <laughs> hey, man, there's children in the room. And so, uh, and so he said, uh, he said, no, I'm good. I'm, I serve God. And you, you part of us wife. Amen. Amen. We don't we don't we don't praise Joseph enough for being a man who rejected because there's this picture in society that all men just that's all they want. But Joseph was like, no, nah, I got principles. And so, I, you know, I can't be able to do that. Uh, the Bible says uh, after a while, she started coming every day. You sure? 
you know. Some, some of us, we got about, some, some of us, we got about 72 hours of discipline. <laughs> and then we filling out a blue card. I just, <laughs> they got me on Thursday. I was good Monday. I was good Monday through Wednesday. They got me on Thursday. Uh, but the Bible says that Joseph was saying no every day. He was saying no every day. And he's running the estate. And she's, she's coming at him in different way. Matter of fact, the Bible says she got tired because some people get tired of asking. Some, some, people, some people get tired of asking. And so uh, the Bible says, uh, we, we still in the word, the, the Bible says on this particular day, uh, she grabbed, she grabbed Joseph. She said, hey, listen, listen. <laughs> some people tired, some people tired. She said, hey, listen. <laughs> she said, listen, uh, this, is, this is finna happen. This is this is happening. This, this, is, this is what she tell her. This is happening. This is happening. And so the Bible says she grabbed him. And so uh, the Bible says uh, that Joseph had a coat on. Joseph had a coat on. And so as she is uh, manhandling him, uh, the Bible says, uh, the Bible says uh, he wiggles out. He was out. <laughs> he wiggles out the... <laughs> We're going to have a, a wiggle class for some of our brothers. How to wiggle. <laughs> you got you to gotta know how to wiggle out. <laughs> so, and, so, <laughs> and so the Bible says uh, he leaves his coat behind. He leaves his coat behind. And so the Bible says she takes his coat and she takes it and she lays it on her, uh, on her couch. And the Bible says she lays down next to it. And she waits for her husband to come home. Because some people don't know how to take a no. And they have to hate you to walk away. You were trying to be as nice and you were trying your best not to be a villain. You were trying your best to be respectful. But some people cannot just walk away. So they have to make you an enemy. Because... How dare you reject me and then I keep seeing you every day? There are some people who are real stuck on themselves and they feel like nobody rejects me. You're, you're, not, that, you're not that beautiful. Like you're not, <laughs> you're, not, you're not that, you know, you're not what you think you are. And so, uh, and, and some people are overconfident. There's confidence and then they're over that. And so, uh, and so she lays down and she waits for her husband to come home. Her husband walks into the room and she says, he tried to rape me. I don't, I don't know if you've ever been accused of something that you didn't do. If you've ever been accused of, sisters, if, if, they, if someone has ever said that you did something and you didn't do it. Brothers, if, if, somebody, if somebody said they saw you or, or, or they, they heard that you did something that you didn't do, that can be traumatic. Because what happens is you immediately go into defense mode. I didn't, I didn't do that. And, and so well, if, you, if you wasn't guilty, you wouldn't be screaming that way. Well, how do you defend yourself? Look at your sweating. Just look at your sweating. You're looking guilty. I'm sweating because it's hot. And you, <laughs> that's not the reason. The, the one don't have anything to do with the other. My, my glands, I got an issue with my glands. I ain't take my medicine. My glands are extra open. And so, you, you know, one may not have nothing to do with the other. And you get to the point where it can be traumatic. So here's this teenager. And now he's older. And he was doing so well. He had recovered from the pit. And now we had a situation where... Did you hear Joseph? No, what? The charge is rape. Rape? I ain't even been with no woman. What are you, what are you talking about? No, no, no. She said, because she, hey, man, it ain't looking too good. What are you talking about? Man, your clothes. Why, why are your clothes in her bedchamber? Sometimes it's difficult to explain. It's complicated. Sometimes, sometimes it just takes somebody who loves you to really listen because you just know nobody else will. Have you ever tried to explain your situation, but it was so complicated that you got exhausted before you got started? 
So, I mean, what's going on? Never, never mind. Y'all, hey, y'all think whatever y'all going to think, because sometimes it's a lot. First of all, Joseph, how you get here? Man, I, I still got unresolved issues. If you were Joseph, wouldn't it be hard to trust people? Because my brothers, and then my boss's wife, and I thought, and my boss didn't even believe me. He believed his wife, and she'd be coming at me every day, and I was just trying to, I wouldn't, I was, you know what? I've already had enough trouble, and I miss my daddy. His mother had died by the time you got to chapter 37. So he got the death of his mother. You got his brothers that have betrayed him and sold him into slavery, overheard the conversations of, his, of them killing him. Now he's in Potiphar's house, and God, why would you promote me and elevate me? just to get me thrown in the prison. So now he's in prison. And then while he's in prison, while he's in prison, uh, he has a gift. And so there are two that come to him and they ask him, and they say, hey, listen, we've been having these dreams. And God, and Joseph says, you know what? I can interpret those, these dreams. He says, but listen, when I, when I interpret these dreams, don't forget about me. So he tells the cook, uh, okay, I hear your dream. Oh, I don't know, dog. You ain't going to make it. Uh, it's, it's the quick version of the dream. He said, nah, man, you ain't, you, yeah, you ain't, you ain't going to make it. You need to get your affairs order right now. Like, you finna die. Like, that's, yeah. I don't, I don't know what you put in the, I don't know what your seasoning is, the Tony Sachery. You need to, you messed up. You, you did something. It, it didn't, it, the meat wasn't tender. I don't know what it is, but you're not going to make it. Uh, he goes to the butler. He said, you're going to be all right. You're going to get restored. You finna die, and you, you finna be restored. But when you get restored, please don't forget about me. All right? Uh, everything came to pass. Uh, the cook died. The butler was restored. And the Bible says the butler forgot about him. Don't that make you hard to trust in people? What I'm trying to say is, what have you been through in your life? Like, my, my, my mother died, and my, my brothers betrayed me. My boss didn't listen to me. His wife accused me of rape and I didn't do anything. And now I'm sitting here in prison and I got this charge against me as a rapist and I didn't do anything. And then I'm helping people out uh, in prison. And as I'm helping people out in, in prison, when they get restored, people forgetting about me. Isn't that traumatic? Man, if you think about some of the stuff that you've been through, and just the idea that you're here right now, if it had not been for the grace of God, for you to be able to say, hey, listen, Brother Williams, I done been through this, and I done been through that. I've had this done to me. I've had this forced on me. I've had to overcome this. I've faced this. Oh, but when you don't understand, I've been homeless. I've been abused, I've been lied on, I've had my money stolen, I've had some of the most heinous things said about me. My mama did this to me, my daddy did this to me, my uncles did this to me. You don't understand what I've been through. And sometimes we can be really good at going through, but not healing from. So you know how to get up the next day and then people look at you and say, man, didn't you recover? But, but now you're sitting there with years of unresolved pain. And so now he's sitting there, and then all of a sudden, Pharaoh has a dream. And when Pharaoh has a dream, all of a sudden he's remembered after years of being innocent but suffering. And so um, this... This is not the prison that you, that you would think of today, you know, with the prison bars and a, no, no, no. Joseph is in this African Egyptian prison with no electricity. This is, this is not modern. There are, there are no water faucets. There are no, there are no light bulbs. There are no, I mean, this is dungeon. So if you went to prison at this time, you really serve in hard time. 
They not giving you three meals a day. You not getting any macaroni. There's no cornbread uh, at this prison, right? You, you, you are, you are really doing hard time. So imagine going into prison and then coming out, you're not the same. Some, some of you been to jail and you ain't the same coming out. <laughs> because you wild out on the weekend and you had to spend a few days, you still don't come out to say, it's, it's something happened, something changed. He, he was 17 when he went in, but, but your innocence can be lost while going through storms. By going through stuff, your, your innocence can get lost. And so he goes before Pharaoh, he interprets the dream, and Pharaoh says, because you've done this, I want to reward you. The Bible says he gives him the king's clothes, he puts your jewelry on him, and he makes him the second command over all of Egypt. He calls a parade and causes Joseph to ride behind Pharaoh in a chariot to let the whole country know Joseph is now the man. Right? And created a job based upon Joseph's interpretation. Say, you get to run agriculture. Anybody that needs food, they need to come through you. And then what happens is a famine comes. Now here we are in Genesis chapter 45. In Genesis chapter 45, and Bible reads at verse 1, Genesis chapter 45 and beginning at verse 1. Then Joseph could not refrain himself. We're in verse 1. The Bible says that there's a famine in the land. Now everybody has to come to Egypt to get food. And so Joseph's brothers come. Joseph's 10 brothers come. The only one that's not there is Benjamin, who's left home with his father. And at this particular time, now Joseph's father, whom he loved dearly, who gave him that coat, is now getting older. So his 10 brothers travel and they're standing in line trying to get bread. And guess who's the head of the bread line? <laughs> you want one slice or two, which y'all which need? Y'all need two? Okay. He's at, he's at the head, and Joseph sees his brothers, but they don't recognize him because the last time they saw his brother, he was a teenager. Now he's 30 years old, he's married, and he has a family. It's probably one of this. when I get out of prison, I'm getting, <laughs> Joseph said, I'm getting me somebody, and we start my new family. <laughs> he's, he's, he's grown now, and they don't recognize him. Some people don't record, some people don't remember what they did to you. Some people literally have amnesia and you go to bed and you wake up every morning with the pain of what happened seven years ago. And all of the people who contributed to your pain, they cannot remember that day. You're the only person in the world that remembers that pain. And so Joseph sees his brothers, but they don't recognize him. And, and then he gets to the point where he starts to interact with them and they still don't recognize him. When he got thrown in the pit, he didn't say nothing. When he got sold into slavery, he didn't say nothing. When he was at Potiphar's house, he didn't try to run away. He didn't scream, he didn't say nothing. He got accused of rape, he didn't say nothing. When he got sent to prison, he didn't scream, he didn't cry, he didn't try to break free, he didn't say nothing. When he was forgot about, he didn't complain, he didn't say nothing, he was quiet. When he got released and became second in command in Egypt, he wasn't exuberant, he didn't shout, he didn't scream, he didn't say anything. But here we are in Genesis chapter 45 and he sees his brothers for the first time in 13 years. And as he sees his brothers, can I get this in another translation? Because I want you to see, I, I want you to see this. I'm gonna read it in the King James Version, but I want, you to, I want you to see it in another version. 
Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him. Do you know what it means when he said he couldn't refrain himself? What I'm saying is he's been trying to, what I'm trying to tell you, church, is you're trying to hold it in, and you've been holding it in for a long time. And you, you've been doing pretty good because you know what? You got a new job, and you got a new relationship, and you got a new car, and you got a new house, and you didn't moved on. And, and, and look, you, you, uh, you flossing now, and you looking good now, and maybe you done lost a few inches, and you lost a little weight, and maybe you got your hair did, and, and maybe you got a new cut, and you got a new barber, and... and but if you don't deal with it, it never goes away. And the Bible says he couldn't, he couldn't refrain himself before all them that stood by him. And he what? He cried. Can I get that other, other version? Um, the, the, the other, there's another translation that, that I want you to be able to see. The Bible says he, he cried, caused every man to go out from me. Uh, the other translation says this, Joseph could stand it no longer. This man for 13 years showed no emotion. There are some of you right now like, I don't cry, I don't need to cry, I'm good. I'm No, nah, I'm good, I got it. I ain't worried about them, I ain't worried about people. Doing me, doing me, it's my year, it's my year. Nah, nah, haters gonna hate, right? Lovers gonna love, I'm good. I'm gonna put people, and you so strong, you, but you gonna get to a point where one day you driving and an east wind gonna blow and hit your eyelid. And then all of a sudden, you ain't gonna know where it came from. You'll be watching a commercial and then just start bawling. You'll listen to a song or you'll pick up an old shirt or something and God will trigger that. I believe that uh, the God that we serve, I believe that many times he'll put us in situations because he looks at your heart and says, listen, I'm not going to just let you just keep moving on and acting like that didn't hurt you. I know, I know it hurt you. And even though I've been blessing you in spite of that day, you still gonna have to go back and address that because you know what? If you don't address your trauma, you're gonna ruin all your relationships. And you're gonna say it's them when it's really your past that's killing your present. If you don't deal with your trauma, it's gonna ruin all of your possi uh, possibilities and opportunities and open doors that I'm, because you're gonna get in the door, but your trauma is gonna kick you right back out. And it's going to be a cycle. He could not stand it any longer. There was many people in the room while his brothers was there. And he said to his attendants, everybody get out. I ain't never seen him this emotional. Matter of fact, I thought he would be this emotional in the pit. I thought he would be this emotional in prison. I thought he would be this emotional when he was accused of rape. He never got emotional. You know what he kept doing? He kept just taking it in. He's, men do this. A, a, a lot of men, you'll go through something and you just keep taking it. And you just keep taking the hits. And you have people say certain, you ain't nothing. For men and women, you have people that say, say you know what, you ain't gonna make it. You're not smart enough. You know you're not that pretty. You know you're stupid. You're an idiot. You know you're crazy. Why you think you're gonna do that? You need to go do something else. Look at you, you made a mistake again. You're not as holy as you think. And you got all this stuff. That, and sometimes those statements can be traumatic. Because you're trying your best, and that trauma hit you. He said, out all of you. So he was alone with his brothers when he told them who he was. The Bible says he screamed. The Bible says, then he broke down and wept. He wept so loudly. I love the word of God because it's going to reveal. Don't ever think you by yourself, and you're not the first person. You're not the first person to hold stuff inside and then one day just break. And if we're not, if you can't see this in this text, I don't, I don't know, you, you, you're not reading. I don't know what you, if you can't see it in the text. He cries so loudly, the Egyptians could hear him and word of it quickly carried to Pharaoh's palace. I ain't never heard him cry like, as long as Joseph had been working here, I ain't never heard him cry like this. Your, your new friends and your new environment and your new people today won't understand your tears from 1999. 
And what they don't realize is you crying in 2022 about 2005. They're not, they're not current tears. It's what I'm trying to say is it's, it's trauma. So we define trauma as this. Trauma is an emotional response to a terrible event. Trauma is an emotion. It is how you respond to something. And so this is extremely important because something can happen to me and something can happen to you. It's not trauma to, to you, but because of how I see it and how I perceive it, it's trauma to me. See, you, you may get fired and you may be like, well, hey, it is what it is. On to the next one. It may take me three weeks. It may take me six months to recover. Because some people see their identity in what they do. Or the way that they were fired was traumatic. Somebody can go through a breakup and be like, oh, they come a dime a dozen. Let's go, to the, let's go on to the next one. <laughs> let's go on to the next one. Somebody else break up and they're out of commission for the next two years. And be like, come on, come on, get out there. Mm -mm, I don't like out there. <laughs> out there looks scary. I don't, <laughs> I'm not trying to get out. And some things can break you that another person that went through and it didn't phase them. That's why in the church we have to really work on empathy. Because sometimes you can hear another person's story and you'll, you'll say, oh, I've been through that, I'm good. And you're dismissed, but I'm not you. So I'm, I'm so proud that you're strong. And I'm so, I'm, so, I'm so glad that you went through what I went through and it didn't phase you. But I need a gurney. I need a gurney and a girdle because I'm all over the place. I need somebody to come and pick me up because I'm not doing well. And sometimes we'll, we'll dismiss other people's pain because you can relate to the event, but you did not have my spirit. You did not have my heart. So I'm crying every night. Trauma is an emotion of how you respond to certain things. Some of us have gone through traumatic events and you didn't know it was trauma. Some of you walked into certain places and you saw certain things at a young age that you weren't supposed to see. And it took you 15 years to find out that that was traumatic. You saw what happened to your mama, and you saw what happened to your daddy, and you saw what happened to your family, or you saw what happened to your friend, and then what you end up doing is you end up making a covenant, or you end up making a new rule for yourself. And as a little child, you saw that, and you say, you know what, when I get older, I'm never going to do that. Because of something that you saw when you was just a child. You couldn't quite comprehend what was happening and everybody was fighting and going back and forth. But what you said to yourself as a child, as you say, you know what? I'm never going to do that again. I ain't going to never let nobody talk to me. I ain't gonna, and, and now here you are as an adult and you barking at everybody. And you barking at everybody because of something that happened to you when you were 10. Something that you saw. Trauma can happen to somebody, uh, an event can happen to somebody else, but it's traumatic to you. You can watch a loved one go through something and it's traumatic to you. There are some people right now, they, they have cursed off all relationships because they didn't seen about four or five of their girlfriends go through something and they'd be like, I'm good on life. No, nah, I see. Uh, uh. And you, you, you try to minister, you, and you try to help a few other people. And you be like, no, nah, I, I don't want it, even though it didn't happen to me. But you can be so close to somebody else's pain, it's actually traumatic to you. And what you'll end up start doing is you'll start making new laws for yourself. Be careful of the laws that you create for yourself that God is not a part of. Because what if God says, I want you to go in that direction, and the first thing that comes to your mind is your trauma, and you say, oh, no, no, I'm not going over there. So now God can't use you because you're trying to protect your st yourself from stuff that you've seen. You're trying to protect yourself from trauma that you've experienced, and, you, and so you tell yourself, well, God, I can't do that because if I do that, this may happen to me, and it's going to hurt me again. And so what I have done, God, is I have created scriptures. I have created laws for myself to protect myself because I promise there's not another man, there's not another woman, nobody will ever hurt me again. 
And if you come in my space, you're going to catch all of it because I'm never going to feel that pain ever again because trauma is an emotion. But if you don't deal with the emotion, it walks with you for the rest of your life. And every person that you meet meets that trauma. And they think it's you and it's not you. It's to hurt you. And who would you be? How would you love if you was healed? We would have to get to know you all over again. Okay, so what is your name again? <laughs> we would have to get to know you all over again. How would you act if you were healed from everything you've been through? You got to ask God for healing. So I, I mentioned this. Uh, 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 there are three types of trauma. There are three types of trauma. The first type of trauma is acute trauma. Acute trauma is an event. It's a single incident. It's that thing that happened in 1998. It's that thing that happened in 2011, and you have not quite been the same. It's an acute trauma. It's a, it was in a single event, but you haven't got over it. The second type of trauma is called chronic trauma. It's called chronic trauma. Chronic trauma is something that is repeated so this happened to me from the age of seven all the way up until 13. They did this to me every month, every year or so. This is what happened to me from this, from this age to that. That's called chronic trauma. That means you've experienced this event over and over and over and over again for years or days or months. The reason why it's important to understand the different types of trauma because you don't deal with all trauma the same. Because what happened to you over 10 years is not the same way you deal with somebody who had a single event. It's different because some, some events, they get down deep into your soul. There's a man right now who says, I've not been able to tell anybody I've been molested. They touched me. And I'm a grown man, and I got my family, I got my kids, and I got my grandkids, and I, and I got all this stuff. And I can't tell anybody that this happened to me. And it's hard to get healed from something you're not willing to acknowledge. And this is what the devil does. The devil says, don't tell nobody. You keep it a secret. If they're going to find out, they're going to laugh at you. They're going to they look at you strange. They're going to look at you as you were fast or that you deserved it. And you're going to have all these thoughts that the devil plants in your mind to keep you, ha to have that thing kept in secret. Because confession produces healing. But the devil wants to shame you so you never confess you never admit it, and because you never acknowledge that it happens, then the pain says we can live forever. We can live forever because pain and sin dies with exposure. Once you open it up, the sin dies, the pain dies because it's no longer your secret. It's no longer that little thing that you're trying to protect and keep everybody from. And there are some people that you, that you feel like you're real close with and you want to tell them, but you can't tell them. You can't tell them. Do I trust them? Okay, I'm going to share them. Okay, I'm about to tell them my secret and I'm going to look dead in your eyes. And if I ever see... Uh, on my way to finishing the story, if I see that you look at me or move any kind of way, I'm going to stop and I'm, I'm going to act like I was playing. And you, you over there talking slow. So they open the, never mind, I'm just playing. Never, you know what? I was just kidding. I, I'll tell you later. It was something. And you end up dismissing. Because it's even the fear of it being found out. The third type of trauma is complex trauma. And complex trauma is, I lost my job and I can't feed my children and I was raped and my relationship with my mother is non-existent. 
She slapped me, she hit me. We don't talk. And the doctor says, it's not curable. And I got in a fight with my best friend. I got multiple things that are going on and all of these things have broken my heart. Somebody said, what's going on? I don't have one problem and you don't have enough time. I got a bunch of stuff. I got a bunch of stuff going on in my life right now. And I got, I, I need, a, I need, a, I need like seven counselors for all the different stuff to, that I, I need someone to specialize in this pain. Because I got a bunch of stuff. And sometimes you can have so much pain, you forget where to start. I don't even know how to start talking. Because I got this, this, and that, and this thing going on, and that. And then I got the stuff that just happened to myself. I want to share these, these four type of responses, uh, and then we'll close. There are three types of trauma. There are three types of trauma. And I hope you see this in the scriptures. Don't be like Joseph, that you waiting 13 years and now you falling on the floor and you screaming and you crying because of unaddressed pain. There are four types of responses to trauma. The first one is to fight. The first one is to fight. When people go through certain things and they experience certain pain. Some people go through a traumatic event and the first thing that they want to do is they want to get at somebody. Because <sighs> it hurt and the only way to feel better is to make you hurt. This first response is where the phrase hurt people, hurt people comes from. Because I'm hurting and I gotta get at somebody else and I'm sorry it's you, you just happen to be in the way. You were, you, were the, you were the next person that I met after my trauma and I'm going, I gotta give it to somebody. The second type of response is I'm out of here. It's flight, it's flight. Sometimes you think people don't wanna be around you when really they're hurt and they wanna, but they gotta go. They got to go and they won't give any explanation. It won't make sense. They're not going to sit with you for two and three hours and break down what's going on in their life because they don't really know yet. They just know something traumatic has happened and the only thing that makes them feel better is that I got to get away from everybody. I got to run. So then they experience flight. For some people, they fight. For other people, it's flight. Number three. The third response to trauma is freeze. The third response to trauma is freeze. They get stuck. And when you talk to them, they still talk to you about 1976. You be like, hey, hey, that's, that's over. And they, they can't move. They stuck. You see them five years later, and they're still talking about the same thing, hanging on the same corner, doing the same stuff, and you be like, hey, what's going on? Hey, you, hey, you got to move on. They don't know how to move on. When that event happened, they froze. It's like they froze in time, and the whole world is passing them by, and mentally, emotionally, even their, their, their language is stuck in that moment. And every time you talk to them, they bring up everybody that was involved at that time. Hey, Lyndon B. Johnson is gone. He dead. Like, you still talking about what he did and you still talking about a time frame and nobody's, a lot of them people, a lot of them people, they, they in a different stage of their life. If you don't heal, you'll get stuck. And you know what you'll be saying 20 years later? I was supposed to be here, but they did this to me. And I'm gonna tell you this, the world don't care who you blame. The world don't care who you blame. And the world will let you stay stuck. This is why 
what, what do we say here in North Collin? We are here to heal, help. Why is it so important? Because God can't use you when you're living in trauma. God can't use you when you're stuck. It's dangerous to be around anybody and you have not dealt with your past and you have not dealt with your sins and you have not dealt with your secret stuff. Because eventually it's going to spill out. And so some people, they're, 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 they're stuck and in, in, in they're frozen. And then the last response. This one was created by Pete Walker. He calls it the fawn response, F-A-W-N. He calls it the fawn response. This response is one of the most dangerous. Because some people fight, some people flight, some people get stuck. And there are some people who fawn. Fawn is, you hurt me. And I believe to stop the hurt, I'll do whatever you want me to do to please you. So even though you hurt me, I'll cook your food, I'll wash your feet, I, whatever physically you want me to do, I'll, I'll do that. Matter of fact, I, I don't care about my boundaries, I don't care about my principles. My whole focus is to aim to please you because if I think that if I please you more, we'll stop the pain. Even if it goes against my principles, if you ask me to do it, I'll do it. Even though if it's embarrassing, even if it goes against my religion, even if it goes against my faith, the only thing I want to do is I just want to please you and I want to make sure that you're so pleased that I believe that if you're pleased, that I'll get some rest. This is what is found in many dysfunctional relationships when someone is being abusive and the other person believes, well, then if I do more, then the pain will stop. If, if I go above and beyond, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm, I'm, I'm going to get a bigger cake. And what I'm going to do is I'm going I'm to invite more and I'm, I'm, I'm going to spend more money and I'm going to get a bigger present. I'm going to do this. And everybody on the outside looking in and saying, you looking crazy. Like, what are you doing? This person ain't even worth it. Sometimes the people who hurt you, you, you don't want to let them know that they hurt you. And so what you do, and when every time that you see them, you're just super nice to them and you're just extra kind to them because you don't, you don't want to discuss it. You don't want to deal with it. And so you're extra nice to hide from having conflict. Do you need anything? Oh, no, 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 I, I'll get it for you. I'm going to show up at every birthday party. I'm going to show up at every event that you're doing. And I just want to let you know that I'm supporting you, even though you broke my heart. You broke my heart. And I don't really know how to tell you that you broke my heart. And because I don't like conflict, be careful. Be careful, members, if you don't like conflict. Because the devil will use that to keep you in bondage. So you're trying to avoid the conversation when you really need to have the conversation. We got to stop the abuse. And we got to stop the pain. If you're here this morning and you realize, you know what, Brother Williams, that's me. I got so much stuff hidden in my heart, I don't, I can't trust nobody to talk about. It. All, all the things that I've experienced, what I'm saying is the devil's going to use that until you free. Until you release that. He will use that to beat you up. You're going you're gonna to experience extra scars if you don't learn to let it go. On this next Wednesday, I want to I wanna talk about and go into deeper on how to let it go. I want to talk about deeper how to let it go. But one way to let it go is you got to confess. I've said this for the last several weeks. You don't have to go into detail. You don't have to give us step by step what happened. But one, th one person that you have to be honest with is you have to be honest with God and tell God what, what has happened and what you've been through. Stop living in secrecy, thinking that you're protecting yourself when actually the secret is poisoning you. There's a quote that I love that says, you're as sick as your secrets. You are as sick as your secrets. When it comes to God, you need to be 100% open with God. If you've sinned, and maybe you've been the abuser, 
Maybe you've been the one that has caused the pain. This is your opportunity to ask God for forgiveness. This is your opportunity to get it right before it's everlasting too late. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, the only way to be right in good standing with God is you have to believe that Jesus died for you, that he was buried and that he rose again. If you'd be willing to believe in that message, repent of your sins, confessing that he is the son of God, then by that confession, today you can be baptized. And the Bible says in Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is shall be saved. Today you can have all your sins washed away if you'll be willing to come. This is praying time. The sermon is over. We've done our praying. We've, we've done our, our, our singing uh, unto God. We've studied in his word. But this part of our worship is extremely important because this is the point where we pray for one for another. And the Bible says if we pray for one another, we can help each other get healed. So if I be the first one to say, hey, pray for me this morning. Because you can't be a child of God and the devil don't attack. Hey, I need y'all to pray for me and I want to pray for you. Let's pray for each other's healing. This, even if you don't fill out a card this morning, let's collectively pray this morning that the children of God get their hearts healed. And we stop having angry Christians trying to worship God. Frown on your face. Jesus, he will fix it. <laughs> you got you to gotta let him fix it. Which means you got to be open. Which means you got to be vulnerable. I'm not saying be vulnerable to everybody, but you're going to have to be vulnerable to God. And you're going to have to trust somebody. It's a devil's lie to say don't trust nobody. That's a devil's lie because that keeps you in your prison. Ask God for wisdom that he'll send the right person so that you can be able to share so you can begin the process. That might be in counseling. That might be in a friend. That might be in a loved one. Sometimes we don't tell our loved ones what we've been through because we like the way they look at us. Remove your pride and say, Daddy, we need to talk. Mama, we need to talk. Call your sister on the phone and say, hey, listen, I ain't never told you this, but I, need, I, gotta, I gotta start trusting somebody. And if that person is not the one, hey, God will protect you. But go ahead and click that switch off in your mind and say that I'm no longer living in secrecy anymore. You'll be, you, you'll be so surprised that by the time you get it out, it wasn't as bad as you thought. Sometimes it's, it's worse in your head <laughs> than it is in reality. And sometimes you'll, tell some, uh, sometimes you'll tell some people, and people will be like, oh, come here, I love you. Hey, I, we, and, and they'll start to give you the resources that you need. And one of the biggest fear is, will y'all still treat me the same if you find out? Will you still love me? And even if those people don't love you, at least you know that they, they didn't have the capacity to. And God will send you a whole another uh, basket of people that knows how to deal with what you're going through. And sometimes God will send some people who've been through some worse things. And you'd be like, okay, well, if you can make it, then I can. I, I was sharing something with, a, uh, and I'm, I'm done. I, I was sharing with a, uh, a guy that I met one time, uh, and, and, um, and I was sharing uh, my story. And then he started sharing his story. And I said, man. <laughs> Well, mine ain't nothing compared, man, I'm sorry. What, what have you been through? I wanted to start, he, he was listening to me. He was being so attentive and he was like, and then he started telling his story. And I was, I was ashamed that I even started my story because I didn't know who God had set me next to. And sometimes God knows how to send the right people into your life. Hey, be careful. Make sure you treat everybody with respect because you may not realize that the new people that God may have sent into your life is because God knows, who knows what you need. You just got to trust. Not them. Trust God to handle them and handle the people. Amen.